Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Mike Vindler. Mike is the CEO of Tronics 3D, a company that does industrial quality 3D printing, also known as additive manufacturing. Mike, welcome to the pod. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. So before we got started, you were telling me a little bit about uh, the struggle you've got sort of trying to explain to people what you do um, in the context of uh, additive manufacturing. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we were laughing, um, you know, kind of the bane of my existence is the term 3D printing and what people associate with it um, and the struggles I have with business development in that space. Um, I think a lot of people have the perception that, uh, you know, I bought a $500 printer on Amazon and I'm working out of my basement. Um, and really, the truth is, is far from that uh, as far as what we can do and, and the capabilities we have in house. Nice. Yeah, so I mean, just for people listening, like I, I've been in uh, the Tronics 3D facility, and it's super impressive. You guys have these giant uh, Hewlett Packard machines and, and like a bunch of stuff, and you do, what is it, like selective laser sintering? We do uh, multi-jet fusion is our primary oh, method of manufacturing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we have FDM printers, we have SLA resin-based machines, we have kind of the whole gamut of printers. Uh, but generally, the printers that we work with, you know, they're production machines. Um, you know, for me, it's, you know, a, a thousand parts is no problem and can be done in days, right? It's very different from, from I think, what most people see on, on YouTube and, and, you know, what most people are looking at on Amazon when they're scrolling. So Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny because I, I have had people, like, confidently sell me, like, 3D print services where it was, like, an FDM consumer grade, you know, or, like, even hobbyist grade, like, before they even were consumer grade. And yeah, yeah, and, and absolutely. And we don't we don't dislike those printers by any means, right? We're we're 3D printing nerds. We we love that stuff. We've built our own printers, we've had our fun. We probably have 20 hobbyist grade printers at our facility that we've all either built or tinkered with or played with or enjoyed. And you know, it's a hobby, right? Yeah. Um, but we don't sell parts off of those printers because <laughs> they don't they don't meet the industrial quality, the you know, the the you know uh you know, the capabilities that we get on our industrial grade machines, right? Even yeah. just par part to part, you know, the strength of the parts, all of that stuff, it just, it just doesn't even compare, so. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You were telling me an anecdote too about um, somebody was hesitant to go with Polyjet Fusion because the parts have powder inside. Oh yeah, yeah, so we, we had a customer, um, we were actually just starting up really, um, and they, they came into our shop and they said, yeah, you know, we don't, we don't really like that type of technology, that powder bed fusion, the multi-jet fusion, the HP printers, you know, again, this is multi-jet fusion. Yeah. The, the multi-jet fusion is, uh, I mean, it's really one of the, the higher end 3d printing processes, but they're like, yeah, when, uh, you know, when, when we, when our parts break, a bunch of powder falls out of the inside. That's like not fused together. And I was like, is a, is a part solid? Like, did you design it in solid and CAD and is it hollow? And they're like, no, no, it's solid. But like every time we break it, it's just this shin thin shell of material. And then there's a bunch of powder falls out and makes a mess and whatever. And it turns out that they were going with one of the ultra low cost online suppliers <laughs> that was basically shelling out their parts. So it was cheaper to manufacture. But when you get them in hand, because you can't see on the inside, it looked like the same part, right? So, so it, it was, probably weighs the same too. Because, yeah, 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 because it's the same amount of powder, powders, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So like until you break it, you would never know the difference. Uh, and that really speaks to people who, companies who are really driving down to get the lowest price on an instant quota versus a company like ours who can work with you who can provide the quality who can, you know you know what to expect and you know what type of quality you're getting yeah for sure that's really cool so how do you go down this road how do you get into uh, additive manufacturing yeah so i spent uh 15 years in r&d at a fortune 500 company cool which was awesome uh it was a great job i can loved I my job one or? yeah yeah so i, I worked at linkedin I mean. uh, yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah i, I you know uh, yeah, I worked at Siemens Energy. Cool. Um, uh, I'm, I was an advisory expert engineer, right? So I was like kind of upper level engineering, fun, really cool stuff, really cool R&D team. Um, we were really a group who 
saw what the issue was in the industry and then came up with a solution for it. We were rarely like told what to do, right? Cool. Which was the kind of the coolest job ever. So what leads me to the out of manufacturing space is everything we built was very low quantity, very bespoke, very unique. And so I just fell in love early on with additive manufacturing. And we, we bought our first 3D printer in 2005. So just to give you an idea, the printers were very different at the time. Yeah. You know, the printers that we spent $100,000 on are not as good as the $500 one you'd buy on Amazon now, right? So, <laughs> so I started very early um, and we grew up from there. And, uh, you know, I was in the energy industry. So, so hours mattered, days mattered. You know, our projects were, you know, we, we got projects at 9 a.m. sometimes that had to ship by the end of the day. So additive manufacturing was a clear choice for us. Um, Eventually, you know, I worked with a bunch of additive manufacturing suppliers and one of the suppliers that I worked with on a regular basis, I was a pretty big customer of theirs. Uh, they actually half of their company got acquired uh, for some intellectual property reasons and the other half came up for sale. And uh, I went out to lunch almost every Friday with the previous owner. And one Friday he said, you know, hey, you know, anybody who wants to buy like half of a 3D printing company that doesn't have any employees or space, but has some machines and customers. And I said, you know, uh, this, this looks like a good way to get out of my corporate job and, and do something <laughs> for myself, right? So uh, I, I, I took on that challenge. So this, it was definitely fun. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that was about a, a year and a half ago or so. So, it was, you know, it's it, you know, pretty recent. That's awesome. So what's it been like scaling that up? Like, what are some of the things you've uh, you've done? I mean, can I ask about, like, the financing side? Like, I'm kind of curious to sort of get into the nuts and bolts of, uh, of your journey over the last year and a half. Yeah, so, um, so I guess, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll start off with a little bit of the financing side. Sure. Um, you know, I sat down, I went out to lunch with the previous owner, right? And he said, you know, anybody wants to buy this company? I said, sure. You know, I'll, 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 I'll shop you around. I'll talk to my friends. I know some other people own businesses. By the end of lunch, I, I really started to think like, oh, maybe I, I want to do this, right? And I, I asked that silly question of like, well, how much do you think this is going to cost, right? Yeah. And it you know, it was a pretty large number, right? And it's a business with customers and revenue and all of those things, right? And uh, so I kind of sat on and said, okay, I think I'm going to do this. And one of the things that was, you know, I never gone out and got financing externally. I'd always done it inside of, you know, I'd sold projects, right? I'd put together business cases, but it was all internal, right? And when you work for a large company, that money kind of flows when you need it. Um, it's but, like monopoly money. Yeah, yeah. I hate to say that, but oh, really, sorry, it's like have... a no, 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 no. I agree, yeah. I agree, and I don't, you know, I don't work there anymore, so it's not a not a big deal, you know. But we, ah, you still don't want to we, disparage. You yeah, know? no, no. Those, uh, yeah, I, I still get along great with with everybody there, um, and I still technically consult for them a little bit, so it's all all good. Um, but no, it's it's definitely different, right? It's different when it's your money versus your employer's money, right? It's a hundred percent a different thing. Um, and so we went out and fundraised and luck we were lucky enough that we had a friend who, who, uh, was already well versed in this subject. Right. Um, and he came on as a private investor. Um, and then we also did a friends and family round and cool. we were able to raise the money we were. And, and honestly, I mean, the biggest compliment that, that people gave me is they were willing to put up the money and, and, and help us fulfill our dreams. I brought on a business partner. Uh, he was great. And. We were able to collateralize some of the loans, do stuff like that. So, you know, it worked out really well. That's really cool. All right. So once you got the cash, what did you do with it? Yeah. So, so we, we, we bought the company, right? And so the company, like I said, it came with a book of business. It came with equipment. Um, and so we were basically out of cash at that point. Oh, okay. right. So you it know. all just went into, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we bought a company. Uh, we structured the deal a little uniquely that we could pay most of the money up front and then we could pay some of the money later, which was great. Interesting. So that gave us some working capital. And what I can tell you is, is that we did not anticipate how much working capital we needed. <laughs> right? That's that's always the thing. It's like, yeah, you know, I, there. I did some numbers. I did whatever, right? You know, and I think, I think a lot of us have been in that same situation yeah. where it's, it's, okay, I think we need this. And then you get to a point where you're like, holy shit, well, that's this, that I need a lot more than that. Yep. Um, luckily we had, you know, uh, banks and, and, and again, we went back and our friend as well, you know, he does a lot of investments and stuff like that. He actually, I called him and I, I kind of laid out the situation, you know, and said, hey, you know, I really vastly underestimated this. <laughs> and he kind of chuckled for a minute and said, yeah, I, I kind of thought you did. 
That's and, funny. Uh, and you need me to wire you some money now? <laughs> you know, like, and it was kind of like he had already, he had, he'd been down this road before. He knew before. this was going to happen. Yeah, and he kind of knew this was going to happen, which, which I appreciate him. I appreciate him letting me run the course and know, you know, and then backing me up without me knowing that he was going to back me up. I didn't, I didn't know that that's how that conversation was going to go. But he laughed so a little. So you're in your pants. He's like, right. He's, he, yeah. yeah. He's like, he's like, this is how it goes every time. Right. You know, he's yeah. like, yeah, he's like, yeah, the first time, oh, you're a first time business owner. Congratulations. You know, this is, this is, I guess this is a rite of passage where you got to figure out that you actually need a lot more money than you thought you did. So, yep. and uh, a lot of that was just cash flow, right? It wasn't sales. It wasn't, you know, any of that type of stuff. It was just, it was just, you know, we work with fortune 500 companies that, that give you net 90 terms. That's brutal. Yeah. Yeah. That's terrible. So for a small business, you know, we started out as the, just the two of us. Um, we've grown it to five people now, but it's, yeah, still those type of terms and business, all that stuff is, is pretty, pretty tough for small businesses. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now that's, that's been a peeve of mine for a while is just like the fact that the large company wants the most ridiculous payment terms yeah. from the small company. Yeah. They're, they're the like, ones who have all the money. Yeah. Come right? on. Like really? Yeah. <laughs> you guys, I, mean, I, I get it. But you guys yeah, want net uh, 90 plus grace. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. How was that? Yeah, you're not you're not so. sending these companies to collections either, right? That's not a you know you're not going to risk any future business because they paid four days late or something, you know? Yeah, well, four days late's not bad. I had yeah. a like a Fortune 500 company approach me and say, well, they wanted net 60 but plus grace, and I'm like, well, what the hell does that mean? Like, well, you know, it'd be like net 78. Like, and I'm like, huh? <laughs> Prefer not to do that. <laughs> but, that's it. Yeah, you know, like, that, that's that's really interesting. I haven't run into that yet. I've actually. And the thing I do appreciate working with some of the larger companies is that I generally get paid on like day 90 exactly. Oh, okay. That's right. That's not, and at yeah. least you can know. And you can, like, you can work with that. Like, yeah. you, you sort of like, you know what your financing needs. Right, are, exactly. It yeah. sucks for 90 days. Yeah. But you, you, there's an end at the, at, there's yeah. a light at the end of the tunnel, right? At that day 90 point. Um, and, and, and if and, you've managed to cover the gap and then you get the margin and you're doing consistent enough business, eventually there's a lag. But right. It's, it's like the, yeah. it's, it's like the 10 days leading up to day 90. You're like staring at your bank account every day, hoping it doesn't go negative. But like, yeah. <laughs> but up until that point, you know, how that goes. <laughs> uh, I think yeah. we've all been there at some point, yep. right? It's, yep, a, yep. yeah. Now you get that big job and you're like, yeah. Only when we get to this day. And like, do you guys bill like pretty frequently that like, how often do you bill your clients? Yeah. So, I mean, so we bill as things get delivered. Okay. Um, but I'll sometimes, you know, and again, I think for manufacturing, we're really short term, which helps us. Yeah. Um, so I am, you know, I'm net 30 on all my materials, which is fine. But from the time I buy the materials to the time where I have a large production run done, it might be another 30 days. Yeah. Right. So I might be paying for materials at the end of that production run and then net 90 starts. Oh, geez. You know, right. So so now, you know, so it's not even like I get my 30 day grace period on so my like net 30 terms. Well, yeah, yeah. It's a little I mean, a little different. It's than a that. sliding yeah. scale. It's yeah. you know, you can you can run this, you know, the charts however you want or whatever. But there is. Yeah, it's it's a little bit of a painful process. But we do build as parts are delivered. And luckily for us, our turn time is really fast. And I think that's I mean, that's the advantage of added manufacturing. Yeah. It's like, you know, why do you want to do this? OK, I need parts quickly. I need, you know, whatever. So. That, that helps us a lot of times, you know, like our standard delivery time on parts is five days. Yeah, right? that's pretty awesome. You know, and that's that's pretty normal for us. That's like no expediting charges, you know, so. Yeah, no, that's wild. So we usually bill like net 14 with new clients or net 30, we, we negotiate to mm -hmm. with some repeating clients. We might go higher than that, but for the most part, like we try to just, because we're, I mean, we're fully bootstrapped. So we try to keep people kind of low yeah. Um, and then we bill weekly uh, and it's all services. So we or so we invoice weekly. And so that kind of gives us like a shorter, you know, cycle to getting paid from, you know, when the hours are paid. And then. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm jealous, uh, you know, but I also <laughs> know is, is so working for Siemens Energy. Right. And yeah. then being a supplier of Siemens Energy. I know I know because I brought on companies that I needed work done for. Yeah. And they also didn't like the net 90. So I understood that going into it. Right. Yeah. But then, then they would ask me, it's like, can we get better terms? And I would say, you know, here's an email that you can try. Right. You know, it's not yeah. my, it's not my, I can't make that decision. I'm an engineer. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm requesting purchase orders. Yeah. Uh, but I also know that they tell you, well, do you want, if you want to do business with well, us. Well, you worked there for 15 years and the fact right. that you haven't been able to get better terms with your company yeah. is like 
kind of proof oh, we, positive of that. We actually recently negotiated better terms with Siemens, which nice. was tough. Congratulations. And uh, that was that was thanks to a person who works there that knew how to say the right words. So I, I to that person, I really appreciate it. <laughs> but there, awesome. we, we work with a bunch of other companies as well that are in that same kind of you know sphere that yeah. that, that also give us bad terms. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah, we, we sort of like jive well with like medium sized businesses, but um, I don't know. I mean, I guess no, no. Really, I, yeah. So I would say um, it seems like Fortune five hundreds are just kind of like that across the board, like net sixty or net ninety or net one twenty if they're yeah. automotive. Yeah, yeah, and, and <laughs> yeah, that stuff's painful. Um, <laughs> and even just from a like the companies that I would want to work with. Um, I would really, the small and medium sized businesses are the ones that I enjoy doing work with. Yeah. I think you, you get a much better personal connection with, I think Siemens is the exception because I had the 15 years of personal connection with those people, Yeah, you know, and I still have that, but, but there's a, uh, there's a lot of production work that we do for some of these larger companies that like, I don't even know the engineer who made the parts. I don't know what they're going into. You know, they're just running through our printers and we're spitting out parts and they go in boxes. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's not, that's not fun. Right. That's, yeah, that's, 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 that's work. Right. Yep. Um, some of the stuff that we do with our sm even our smallest clients are, are guys that are startups that are two people that are, that are trying to, you know, put together something with, with no money and, and coming to us and, you know, trying to, you know, ask for the impossible, which, which I get. And I actually, I love some of the challenges that come along with that. Yeah. It's an right? interesting market for um, sure. Yeah. And so, and so sometimes we can, sometimes we can really help them solve those challenges in unique ways. And, you know, maybe it doesn't make us the most amount of money or whatever, but man, we can have a lot of fun with that. So yeah, for sure. That's what keeps me going to work. That's interesting. May not pay the bills, but that's what keeps me going to work. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. The startups, I don't know. I just, with those guys, like, I, I kind of got sad with seeing them go out of business. Mm. And so I, we I, we probably do, like, most of our business is, like, medium size these yeah. days just because, like, well-funded start. Like, maybe, like, $10 million above in funding is, okay. is kind of yeah, our, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a sweet spot. That, that's a sweet spot. And, you know, we, were, we, have some, we have some good customers in that range where... That you know, still feels intimate. Like, I right. still feel like you get to know them really well. Still have a great conversation. Yeah. You know, you can still kind of be you know, a little more transparent with each other, yeah. you know, find better. I think we actually find better value with those customers. Like, I think they find better value in us. And I think, you know, we can provide, you know, we can provide more to them yeah. because of those connections. And because well, and you said there's like, I mean, you're an engineer, like your yeah. partner's an engineer. You guys obviously can probably provide additional value. Like if you find some oh. optimization or. A hundred percent. If yeah. there are some companies that, you know, they just, they email us files. We quote them, they order it, we deliver. Great. You know, it's fine. Again, it pays the bills. It's yeah. what we do. Uh, and then there, then there's the companies that, that come to our facility, that see what we do, that talk to us, that, that call us and say, hey, I got this part. I don't, I don't know how to make this. Or, hey, I, I just had you quote this and, and the price is really high and I didn't expect that, right? And yeah. we like to have that honest conversation. And, and because of our experience and because I was a customer, I was literally a customer of my own company at one point. Nice. Right. You know, like seriously, I was the customer before I was the owner. That's honestly pretty awesome that you've had that insight. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I get that perspective. And then the customers that actually consult with us, that talk with us. And a lot of this, I mean, we give away for free, right? Because we want the business. We want to want to have happy customers. We want to do right by people. Um, those are the customers that we think see the most amount of value from what we do, right? Um, I think oftentimes we can we can lower manufacturing costs by just by just tr being transparent on how we price things, right? Um, one of the things that I, I always love to tell customers on powder bed fusion parts, I price parts on the space it takes up my machine, right? Because machines cost money, you know, to run, to do whatever, and the amount of material I use. I don't really care how complex it is. You want to put your logo on it? Great. That's like free. If, if you emboss sure. the logo, it might cost you a penny. If you deboss the logo, it might save you a penny, right? You know, nice. so so when when we start to get into that level of transparency and we really connect with the engineers, we can we can unlock so much more value, and it doesn't cost any us any more. Because now they deboss the logo, right? Because now they put cool logo stuff on it. I mean, <laughs> when so when I worked at Siemens, one of the things that I loved to do was if if we had like robotics and stuff like that, I would love to, I love to put the size of the bolt and the torque spec on the 3D printed part. Oh, cool. Right? And now like when you're servicing it, 
right now i don't know if they follow the torque spec i don't i don't know i'm an engineer right i care about those things you know not everyone yeah. does right i mean that, that's but, important <laughs> but it, but if it takes me two seconds in cad and it's free and i think you can add reliability to our operation right that's an extreme value add that didn't cost the additive manufacturing company anything more right that they're not going to charge more for yeah but the value is is i think can be huge if it's applied in the right ways right you know yeah. so those are things that we love to do um that's awesome yeah that's really cool so um i guess how did you get into like if i can go back a step even further mm -hmm. how did you get into engineering in the first place like what made you want to become an engineer what are some of the things you worked on when you were at siemens yeah um, so uh so if we go way back right uh yeah. so i would say my engineering is somewhat genetic okay uh both of my grandfathers were engineers uh, my one grandfather was literally a rocket science a rocket scientist like literally pictures of him standing next to Werner von Braun and like oh, cool. you know I have I have uh I don't even know if I should say this because I'll probably a Smithsonian will come after me or something I have a piece of a Viking rocket thruster on That's my badass. desk <laughs> right an actual I think we think it's flight flown I don't we didn't we didn't know my grandfather actually had it until after he passed away but there was a <laughs> it was in a box with a note saying what it was um, and then I went back and I looked at picture and the Viking rocket is one of the first rockets that us ever sent to space. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like the, or it's, it's the OG of rocket science. Um, <laughs> awesome. you know, it's just, just, just post world war two. And, um, and so we pulled it out and I took a picture of it and I was able to identify in the pictures of the Viking rockets where this piece of the thruster was cut. Oh, out. that's cool. So I didn't like sits on my desk. Right. So, so the history of engineering in our family is like, so yeah. it's it's like band sawed out of a thruster. Yeah, like they must have been doing testing on it or like was oh, checking cool. for cracks. So it probably was flight flown then if they, yeah, if they it, cut so, it up like that. So yeah, and, and so it, it was definitely fired. You can tell it was fired. Yeah. So it was either static fired or flight flown. That makes sense. A um, bunch of them blew up and they went and recover them. So the, it wasn't those. But, you know, yeah. I, I don't know. Who knows? Right. Yeah. But it's still a cool piece of history. Um, and just to know that, that my grandfather had a part in that is, is awesome. Right. And just to yeah. have it on my desk when I'm working from home, it's like right there. Like that's, that's, that's super that's, cool. That's one of the coolest things. Um, so yeah, so I say it's genetic, um, both sides of my family. Uh, my father was in, you know, it was in the, um, you know, in the airplane industry and, you know, worked on really high end private aircraft, stuff like that, you know, so, so it, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. That's for sure. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, you know, so as a kid, I, I took everything apart, barely put it back together. You know, standard standard stuff, right? That's super cool. Well, I, I, I've i got a, um, a gold ring. I actually uh, misplaced it recently. I'm kind of annoyed about it, oh. but it was my grandfather's on my mom's side, and he was apparently the uh, chief mining engineer responsible for, like, procurement for the oil for D-Day. Oh, so wow. for a while, whenever I was feeling self-conscious, like, you know, going to, like, a big negotiation or something, I would wear that ring. And it kind of made me feel like I feel like it's like your Viking yeah. rocket. Yeah, oh, 100 percent. Bit like I, you know, I'd feel like a little more empowered and yeah, you know, like yeah, yeah. I got, got yeah, the that, old man. Kind that's of very cool. Me. Yeah. I think there's there's so much stuff that people have done in the past, and I think I think a lot of us all have kind of a similar story that we yeah. rely on for strength, for inspiration, for whatever. So yeah, so it's cool to hear about everybody else's. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. So okay, so both grandfathers were engineers. Any other yeah. engineers in the family? I'm guessing like everyone. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, I like I have I have cousins that are entrepreneurs and engineers. You know, nice. I have all that type of stuff. Um, you know, uh, my brother, uh, he was not he didn't like school, right? I, I didn't like school either, but he liked it less than I did. Um, but he he's again he he is extremely mechanically inclined. You know what I mean? It's like he's he's a little transient and he does, he doesn't like to get locked down. He likes to go sailing across the Pacific and do wild stuff like that. But he's one of those people who can walk in to an automotive shop, right? Which, you know, again, he doesn't, I don't, I don't think he graduated, whatever. It doesn't matter. Right. I don't, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't care. I really <laughs> don't care. Uh, my business partner doesn't have a college degree. I don't care. That's like, awesome. you know, it's, yeah, I think, I think it's probably for I the always, better. Yeah. I respect someone more if they, you know, went to work sooner and yeah. So yeah. And so I'll, I'll finish talking about my brother, but he's one of those people like he's like, oh, yeah, I lived in Alaska for a few years, went to a ski resort, worked on all their heavy maintenance equipment. He's like, I walked into the shop 
And he's like, he's like, they were doing everything wrong. So I like, I like rebuilt all the maintenance operations, like redid, you know, like he's like one of those people who just walks in and just like figures it out. Yeah. Figures it out. And then he just gets bored and moves on. He's like, never gets fired. Like people always want to yeah. keep him on. So he's, he's got the same ability. I just don't think he, he's got a different personality, but I think he could, he could do, he could do all the same, all the same things, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. And my brother's like a serial entrepreneur. Like he, um, He's trying to figure out his next startup now. He's like on the Y Combinator oh, forums, wow. trying to find his next co-founders. And I think he's got like two guys he wants to found a company with. Um, and so they're working on some kind of like uh, enterprise software play, I think is, is kind of his game. So that's, that's probably what they're gonna do. Um, my sister has like an art publicity company. Um, and then I've got a contract engineering company. Uh, yeah. So. so it definitely runs in the family on your yeah. side. Yeah, yeah that's for cool. sure. Uh, my that's granddad, cool. my dad, doctors. Uh, my aunt runs the stem cell lab at Yale on that same side of the family. But then my mom's side, just all captains of industry, you know. And wow. Like, yeah, executives and stuff. So kind of, kind of interesting. So I, I think, you know, yeah, like you said, I mean, it's some of it's genetic and upbringing based. Like, you know, you kind of want to do <laughs> what you what you saw. Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever been able to work with any of your siblings on anything professional? So my brother and I uh, collaborated on like a couple of projects um, on my company. Uh, when we were early on, we started out doing um, user interfaces as well as um, like mechatronics. Mm -hmm. And now we do mechatronics and robotics. Um, so we kind of pivoted. We just weren't making a ton of money on UIs, but we helped out with some UIs on his uh, healthcare IT company. And then years earlier, when we were both in high school, uh, we started to make a company to do um, like custom built like p personal computers. So like, oh cool, it was stupid. We called it Krausware. <laughs> so it was like our <laughs> last name. And we we like made like a logo in Photoshop and like a website in Dreamweaver because it was the early two thousands, mm -hmm. and that's that was the thing to do. <laughs> and um, we uh, you know we started doing that, and then I got shipped to boarding school, and we never really got to finish it. Yeah, <laughs> bummer. So, yeah, uh, but you yeah. started earlier. I'm sure you learned a ton from it, right? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, like every, you know, kind of half-baked idea that you kind of go through mm -hmm. with, you learn a bunch of lessons, and that makes you smarter and, you know, more resilient on your next one. So, yeah, it was, it was oh, pretty absolutely. fun. What about you? Did you ever do anything with your brother? Not not really. Not in an entrepreneurial way. I mean, I'm sure, you know, as kids, we built a bunch of stuff, you know, whether it be like, a, you know, I don't know, a fort in the backyard or, or whatever, right? Um yeah, I don't know. We've never done anything professionally together. Uh, I think the one thing is, though, my brother just recently reached out to me. And he, like I said, he he kind of explores the world. He's kind of one of those more, you know, transient people that just like, you know, he gets tired of somewhere after a year and just leaves. <laughs> right. That's cool. I'm kind of jealous. Like, I mean, yeah. he's he's seen the like the entire world. He's seen in the entire world. Right. That's cool. Um, and so but he recently just reached out to me and said, hey, I have an idea for an app uh that is that has to do with sailboat maintenance interesting and additive manufacturing huh. he said there's a bunch of stuff on sailboats that they don't make anymore right sailboats everything's unique everything is one-off everything's you know like it's a very small market yeah that kind of makes sense. yeah no they didn't make a thousand of anything you know yeah and uh and so i was like i, I like that and and so we we just started kind of kind of brainstorming about how we could do something like that so yeah so we're we're kind of exploring that and that's kind of why i asked is is we're just that's kind of looking at that so by the time you need a new part for a sailboat, I mean, I, I don't, if I can't get into the nuts and bolts of your business, I won't ask about no, it. No, no, it doesn't matter. By the time you need a new part for the sailboat, I would think your old part is fucked up. Like you've, you've busted it in some monumental way. How do you, how do you capture that? Like to do like a 3D scan or like whatever you're doing yeah, so, at that so, point? Yeah, so actually, so what he wants to do and, I, you know. I'll get into the really basic details, but he really wants to just start 3D printing pulleys. Like the oh, pulleys. Interesting. Now they call them shivs and there's a whole terminology around sailboats. But that it's I a fucking pulley. It, sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's a difference. He's explained it to me like four times. I'm still calling sure. a pulley. He probably tells me I'm wrong. Right, whatever. <laughs> right, doesn't matter. Uh, he said, but they come in like all different shapes and sizes, right? But there's only so many dimensions that you really oh, I need gotcha. off of it, yeah. right? But when you go to like, a boat parts store or whatever, they never have the one that you need, right? You know, like, sure. Yeah. So granted, there's only so many like dimensions you can take off of it, but but as a as a unit of measure, it could be any size, right? And it so, could be so, metric or imperial. Right, and yeah. so the permutations of that become like, you know, this huge number of different pulleys or shivs or whatever out there, I don't know, yeah. whatever. So there's a million different sizes, <laughs> yeah. 
but there's only you know so many dimensions that you need so i actually think it's a pretty elegant idea on how to do it um there's some material challenges there's some you know some manufacturing challenges with it whatever and that's that's where he's pulling me in and and obviously i have the equipment to do all the testing and the manufacturing and all that type of stuff that's cool. so, so i think we're in a unique space so i don't even think giving away the idea helps because i think you have to have some pretty unique uh situations to be even able to penetrate that market right yeah that makes sense yeah that's cool i'm sure there's other markets like that like i think of like mm -hmm. aircraft components probably um yeah yeah we just got a printer that's, that's good for aerospace but man we started to go down the path for uh what type of certifications you need oh okay. and uh, i was sure. like oh man i gotta like i gotta hire a full-time employee just to do paperwork you know and uh but <laughs> luckily we're, we're talking to some some possible many some partners that that already have the certifications that might be able to contract us to make the parts and then they do the inspection type of deal so we're trying to trying to work some ways on that but what but are yeah. the materials on that that printer yeah so we uh so and and we just got it we just got a robos argo 500 robos which is like argo 500. yeah it's a filament based machine so it's what you would think when you buy a 500 dollars amazon printer but Lots. it's big uh, prints 500 millimeters cubed and whatever, and, oh, cool. and, and but it prints in like peak, ultem, carbon filled peak. I think you showed me this one. Yeah, I mean it's like yeah. this thing weighs 4,000 pounds. That's wild. Um, it barely fit in our freight elevator. Maybe you didn't show me this one. Yeah, I probably did. I mean, it's yeah. big. It's big yeah. blue. It's got a bunch of lights on. It. It's cool. Yeah. Uh, but what they basically did is they took a really ultra precise 3D printer that has all the controls you would think that a high-end CNC would have with data logging. It spits out build PDFs when it's done, like of all charts and like all sorts of crazy stuff, right? <laughs> nice. Cool, very cool. But then they built that inside of an oven. <laughs> That's cool. Right, so the entire chamber gets up to 200 degrees centigrade. Which is a whole lot of like design uh, challenges to yeah. get something that does that. So, like, so how, do you, how do you like, how do you maintain accuracies within like a thousandth of an inch over a 200 degree centigrade range. How do you keep your electronics from getting fried at 200 centigrade? I mean, well, that's, and that's all about the the shielding and the airflow and the you know I don't yeah. I didn't design the printer. I mean, I can see what they did. I'm an engineer. I can dissect it and stuff. Um, but it's all about the isolation and 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 all that type of stuff and lots of lots of airflow. You Probably know, liquid cooling. I would imagine in some places. Uh, it's, it's actually all. I think it's almost all air cooled. It consumes that's like cool. it consumes like 18 cfm off our compressor while it's running. Oh, I wow. mean, there's like a lot of like yeah. And then the filaments you got to keep dry. And when I say dry, I'm not talking about like don't put water in them. I'm saying like the just latent humidity in our shop is a bad thing. Oh, that's interesting. Right. So so that the the filaments uh, get stored at 150 degrees C with 150 C. 150 C, just the storage, just a spool of, of raw filament gets stored. Like if it's outside of a dry bag, it's at 150 C. And then um and then it has compressed air blowing over it that goes through an ultra drying process. So that way you're 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 putting in ultra dry air at a high temperature, and if we if we turn off the dryer for like two hours, we have to wait another eight hours before we can print again. Oh, like it's brutal. wild. Like these these ultra you know these are like aerospace grade polymers, and and you know there's lots of printers that claim they can print with them, but to print with them well is like a whole different level of thing. And you know we bought the machine, and it's still a challenge. Can I ask what that thing cost? Uh yeah, I mean you know all all in. And when I say all in, I'm talking about like the printer plus basic accessories to get it running. Um, you're talking about about three hundred thousand dollars. That's a decent chunk of change. Yeah, yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. It's definitely uh, that's it's a it's a hard number to swallow when you're getting into it. It's a little more than five hundred. That's for sure. Yeah, and the 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 most impressive part is when we're when we're printing with like a peak material, which peak is one of the highest temp, you know, ultra chemical resistant plastics. Makes Teflon look like nothing, right? Yeah, and uh, is when I buy it on a spool, just like raw material on a spool, I'm paying a dollar a gram. A dollar a gram? Dollar a gram, that's right? That's wild. That's not even that's not even like the cost of it printed, right? That's just the cost of me like putting it on the shelf. Yep. Um, so it's pretty wild. And, and we, but when you get into some of these really high end and what we bought it for is doing production level industrial parts that are for end use, that are for super challenging high temperature situations, you know, all that type of stuff. Um, you know, and it, it works out. I mean, we, we produce some parts that you just can't make any other way or, or you just can't make any cheaper. So that's awesome. Yeah, it sounds like a sweet machine to have. Yeah, it's very cool. It's uh, 
you know, I don't like to see the bills at the end of the day, but but it's it's definitely cool to have, and we we made some <laughs> awesome parts about it on it. Not most of those parts I can't talk about though. Unfortunately. That's all good. Yeah, well, so okay, it. so I mean, just about characteristics, like yeah, can you make a part that like is decently sealed against ingress, like? I mean, or is that difficult with like FDM in general? Like- no, no, no. It's definitely yeah. We can do that. Um, one of the one of the great examples that's pretty public knowledge. We haven't done this yet, um, but the the manufacturer of the printer shows this. this is one of their major case studies. Is and this may sound crazy. Is is a shaft seal, right? So shaft seal is just like a little U shaped piece of plastic goes around the shaft. Has might have a little metal spring in it to help it stabilize. Um, but when you're working with ultra high temp, ultra aggressive liquids, right? Yeah. You need to make it out of peak, right? Yeah. So it's the only thing you can handle that it can, so it's the only thing flexible enough to be a seal. It's the only thing high temp enough to work. It's the only thing chemical resistant enough to work. Yeah. So, so what kind of chemicals are we talking about? What kind of ac- really nasty acids, like hydrochloric? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, I don't know. Crazy stuff. Right. You Sulfuric, know, sulfuric. Yeah. Phosphoric. Yeah. I don't know. Like refineries <laughs> in the energy industry use yeah. it a lot. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. So, and I'm like, I'm picturing like maybe like I don't know, um, like a hundred C or like what's so what's it the kind has of temperature you're talking about? Yeah, so it it has uh, working temperatures um, above two hundred C. Oh wow. Um, yeah. So so that build temp chamber that's just ambient. Like that's just it much that's just to temps. make sure that you can get the material hot enough so it fuses to itself. That's interesting. Yeah. So like you could easily like it could easily go into an oven and cook food and do all the you know, like yeah, yeah. It's it's that's wild. Yeah. 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 But I think um So it's it just likes being in ovens. So that's like its natural habitat. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's it's an yeah. ultra high temp super polymer. And they call them yeah. super polymers for a reason, right? Yeah. They're wild. Um, you know, we print it at like five hundred C or something like that is like our nozzle or I think our nozzle temperatures our nozzle temperatures I think four fifty C or four seventy five C. That's wild. I mean, like, so that's, that's what it takes to get this thing into a liquid state so we can actually extrude it. Um, that's insane. So the material science going on on that machine alone is... Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's wild. Like through the roof. And they had, to, they had to do all sorts of wild stuff. Like, the actual tube that holds the liquid going through, it's, it's like, it's super um, viscous and stuff like that. So they had to do all sorts of ceramic lining and, and all sorts of wild stuff just to even get the material through the machine. Yeah. Um, it's definitely not. Yeah, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And ceramic lining means it has to be rigid in those sections, right? Because that that doesn't really want to bend. Yeah, yeah. I'm just talking about like the little short little area from oh, where I you melt it to where yeah, you yeah. like push it out of the little nozzle. Gotcha, you know? gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, but like the like like my little nozzle assemblies are like five hundred dollars, right? You know, <laughs> like you could buy an entire printer for five hundred dollars, yeah. and my little like my little nozzle with a little heater in it is five hundred dollars. That's wild. So, and then it only lasts, I think, like. Like 200 hours of printing or something <laughs> right so yeah start to do the math you don't want to do the math on that right yeah, you yeah. know um but it still costs more for the material i'm putting through for sure yeah, yeah that makes sense so it's a still dollar a gram yeah yeah exactly yeah. um but i was talking about so pump seal so it, it may sound like a really simple thing but if you're machining a pump seal right you got to start with this round block of peak material and then you got to machine almost all of it away yeah right well that's really expensive at Maybe it's 50 cents a gram if you're buying it in, in blocks, right? If you start with an additive piece, you only make exactly what you need. And then with, with pump seals, you just make it ever so slightly bigger. And then you still machine it to shape, right? To get the tolerance and to get whatever. You know, well, because pump seals have to be like super precise. Yeah. You know, we're, you know, add, our added manufacturing, we can get within a few thousandths, but that's not good. You know, that's not good yeah. for a seal. So they actually they actually print the, the seal and then they post machine oh, it. Oh, that's cool. So it's like almost like an alternative to like an injection molding or a casting. Right. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a near net shape type thing, right? Yeah. So yeah, so like just like you would do with aluminum, instead of starting with a big bill of aluminum, you might cast it and then you might do all your final machining. Yeah. You know, and you might not even have any raw cast surface at the end, but you're getting into near net shape to remove all that type of stuff. Yeah. We can do that with peak and plastics. That's really cool. Um, and then and then anytime, you know, if you had a if you want to change pump seal diameters tomorrow, we could do yeah. it. Snap of fingers, change seals, don't change tooling, don't change anything. So yeah. That's yeah. really cool. So that, that's one of the really simple examples that we can use that just that just talks about the difference, you know, the how you approach where additive manufacturing truly has value, right? Yeah, yeah, that that's incredible. I didn't think of the near net shape uh, piece yet, so that's mm-hmm. I mean that's super cool. Yeah. Um, 
one of the other things that we've been doing with that printer, and this is the fun side of things, right? Like, so we like to have fun. We like to, you know, we like to print stuff for ourselves. Um, so my business partner and I are, are, are car people, race car people. Yeah. Um, so we've been printing some intake manifold parts, some like nice. functional race car parts on, on this printer. And it's, <laughs> it's pretty badass. And it's definitely like, it's definitely the flex when you're like, oh yeah, I, you know, I 3d printed this intake manifold out of like a super expensive polymer that, you know, yeah. like, but it works, it's fully functional end use, you know, whatever, but you can only do it with this, this level of, of equipment. So yeah, that may, it would probably melt otherwise. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you printed it with that $500 Amazon printer, it would, it would be a, li- a pool of plastic in the bottom of your engine bay. Yeah. Or like worse in your engine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's probably where it'd end up, which is even worse. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Now that, that makes a lot of sense. That's really cool. So what are some of the things you do? So you also have another business doing like uh, race car parts, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So my business partner and I, and same business partner, um, Hontronics 3D, uh, about I don't know, maybe like six years ago now or something. It's been it's been longer than I care to admit. Uh, we started another company uh, making race car parts, and it's actually called I Build Race Cars. So nice. IBuildRaceCars.com. Uh, <laughs> when I saw that was available, I knew that had to be the name of the company just from an SEO standpoint, right? <laughs> Uh, and I got a great story about that. Maybe we'll get to that. Uh, but we just make, we make parts for Subarus, right? So like the race car, the STIs, WXs, like the yeah. kind of the race car line. It's people for on the street, you know, it's not like, I'm not talking about like Formula One or anything like that. WXs are fun. Oh yeah, trust me. I, I, I have a couple and I, I've owned a bunch over the years and whatever. And I have other cars too. Um, but my business partner and I, we met because back in like 2009 when we were both younger and modifying cars like that. Um, and both being design people and both being engineers, we would look at our cars and be like, I need a piece that does this. And we would, we would just make it right. I mean, like, you know, that's, that's the perk of being an engineer Yeah, is that you can see something and see a need for it and just make it. Yeah. And then people are like, where can I buy that? And we're like, oh, we just made it. You can't. <laughs> and they're like, well, I want to buy that. And you're like, oh, how, how much money would you give me for it? You know? And then, you know, and then, you know, it becomes a business, right? That's just, yeah. that's how things work, right? You see a need, you do whatever. Um, but one of the funniest things that we go back to, and I think you'll appreciate this. Sure, Mike. My business partner, Jason, uh, he is awesome, but he's like the stereotypical kind of engineering guy. Again, he doesn't have the college background. He actually doesn't like it when I call him an engineer because he doesn't have the education, but he's an engineer. Yeah, I agree. I don't yeah, think like yeah. an engineering degree makes you an engineer. No, no, no. no. I, I, yeah, he yeah. gets weird about it. I don't care, right? Yeah. I think I, I spent a lot more money than he did. That's the only difference, right? And that's probably, yeah. he's better off for it. Um, is I, you know, we were friends at the time. And so I started this company and we had both kind of produced products for other companies and done whatever in this space in the, you know, in the after, automotive aftermarket space. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna start this company. I went on hover. I looked up bunch.coms. So I found ivillracecars.com. And I was like, that sounds great. I'm gonna do this company. And I said, I want you to join me. I know the parts you're making. I know a bunch of the things that you can do, I can't do, right? I'm just like not, you know, he has some really unique knowledge. He builds some awesome parts, like just stuff that just, I don't know if anybody else can do it in the world that I've met. And so he, yeah. can, he can do that. And he said, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, you know, we've kind of been down this path, you know, it's never really worked out in the past and we never really, never really fledged out, you know, so I don't know if I want to do it, but you know, honestly, the biggest problem I have is with the name of the company. And I said, what do, what do you mean the name of the company? I said, it's great. You know, like it's iBuildRaceCars.com. Who doesn't want to build race cars, right? <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, but we're, we're not building race cars. We're making parts. And I looked at him and I said, I get that. I said, but it's okay. You know, it's the name of a company. It's like, you know, it talks about it. He's like, yeah, but we're not building race cars. And he like, it, it took him like, it took him a while. So I, so I started the company without him. Nice. And like for six months, I was like, dude. I'll give you half the company. Just come and join me. And he just, he, for a while, he just couldn't get over the name because we weren't actually building race cars. We were making parts. Yeah. And he didn't think it, it accurately described exactly what we were doing. <laughs> and and we, we laugh so hard about it now because we were friends before, but now we've, you know, we've started two companies together. We've done all this stuff, right? So we're way closer together. And we laugh about it on how his perception and my perception, where I was looking at SEO and I was looking at, you know, like how people perceive it and kind of the feel of it. And he was, he was taking the engineering line of like, that's not what we do. Yeah. Right. And we laugh so much. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's like, okay, I looked it up in the dictionary and that's not what it says. Right. You know, and, and, and so we, we laugh 
hard about that now. So it's just kind of one of those funny stories. But you yeah. know, obviously in hindsight, it, it's it's all been great, and and you know, it's kind of it's a side hustle for us. Um, you know, but we we actually you know we have our industrial space for Tronics 3D, and right literally in the same building, the next industrial space over is iBuildRaceCars.com. Nice. <laughs> so yeah, so we like walk back and forth and do whatever. It's convenient. And, and yeah, and and we've actually started to produce end use parts for for like end use products for iBuildRaceCars.com with our Tronics 3D nice. company. You know, and, and again leveraging all of the technologies leveraging the prototyping capacity all that type of stuff so again elevating both companies together is kind yeah. of a cool way but That's i build really race cool. cars is always this is always the side hustle it's, it's the fun company um but it just doesn't it doesn't have the the market you know the market yeah, size right you know yeah you're pretty real about that yeah for sure end of the day the bills keep coming yeah yeah absolutely yeah that's cool do you have any other ideas for like businesses you're trying to start or uh uh yeah yeah we got a bunch of ideas nice um yeah i don't even know what ones i want to talk about oh no worries you know yeah 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 no but i would say what i would say is definitely follow follow along with what we're doing and not because i've had great ideas it's because jason's had great ideas (laughs) uh not that and again i love jason he's great not that jason can build a company from a great idea but his ideas his ideas are unbelievable so we have a couple spin-offs that we're working on we're looking at some government funding some military funding stuff like that yeah um and then some stuff in and i know we talked about it a little bit earlier and i can't get into too much but it uh we had some really good success in the medical device space that's cool um, that's a fun so, market yeah yeah so we're so we're looking to get, you know, just like, a, I guess, a bigger piece of that pie, right? You know, we, yeah. we had some good success with some of our customers. We had some good success on some other fronts. And, and we want to uh, to capture that a little bit better. We had a good time. And I think we, we understand that space a little better now. That's really cool. Yeah, I think um, I think to your point, one of, one of my reasons for Tronics 3D, for acquiring the company, for going through the process, for bringing Jason on as a business partner, right? Yeah. My long-term goal was I looked at what Jason was doing in his garage and the ideas that he had and the tech he was building in his garage, right? Yeah. And they were things that 10 years later, it was really obvious that we should have all, we, we should have dumped a ton of money into it. Uh, Jason saw it. No one else did, you know? And what I want to do with Tronics was create a platform for us to be able to develop those things in the future, right? I saw, you know, in hindsight, uh, being a friend of Jason's, I saw a tremendous amount of missed opportunity, and we want to make sure that that his next best idea is is, is well captured and 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 brought to market. So, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, that seems like a great pairing. Like, uh, I don't know, you, it seems like you guys complement each other well. Yeah, we're we are very different people in the best way, right? You know, that's but that's a that's a good way to put it. You know, that's awesome. Well, like I've had a few like early, I want to say failures, like trying to start a business with someone that was just like me, mm. and like it's a lot of times it's like a personality clash, um, and then I don't know, it's like when you think you're gonna be best friends with somebody right out of the gate, and like you get to know each other a little bit more, and you're like, eh, there's too much redundancy here, like I don't know. Yeah, I, I think one of Jason and I's biggest strengths is that sometimes we argue about stuff. Nice, right? And I think I think. We, we never we never get mad at each other maybe maybe for a minute you know what i mean maybe for that you know in the heat of the argument or yeah. whatever right but i think at the end of probably almost every conversation that i can think of and i hope jason th- feels the same way i think he does is that we end up with a, a better outcome that neither one of us would have generated alone right um and it may be a hybrid of the two it may be just us checking each other it may be whatever but we definitely we're definitely at odds with each other and our odds with our 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 perspectives at times. But I think it, it it makes us much more robust, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome for sure. That's really cool. So, I feel like we might be at a good point to cut it. I mean, okay. we can keep going, but I feel like this is a good yeah. like long commute. You know, someone can listen. Haven't been keeping track. Yeah, of I don't. Time, I don't but... know how much time we've had. I mean, we've been drinking a little bit. Yeah. We've been hanging out. I've enjoyed it. Um, you know, so yeah, I've, I have no idea how much time has passed, it's, but it's, it's been, been cool. forty-seven minutes. Wow. I just looked. Okay, that's that's actually longer than I expected, which yeah. is which is a great sign. That's shorter than we usually do these, but I'm trying okay. to see if we can go back and like you know, I feel like it's a more engaging piece of content. Yeah. So as we we kind of near the end here, um, is there anything you want to plug on the way out? Um, 
I build racecars.com. Yeah, I build racecars.com. Of course, check that out. <laughs> That's cool. That's the fun stuff. Uh, no, I think for I think for Tronix 3D, I would say if you got if anybody out there has a challenge, if you're trying to bring a product to market, if you're trying to you know really do something unique, if you have a really tight time crunch, just talk to us, right? You know, like don't don't take any preconceived notions in. We won't either, you know. And let's explore stuff. We really like to work directly with our customers to really understand what their challenges are, and we've done some pretty wild stuff over really short periods of time for like reasonable amounts of money, which is kind of like the trifecta of like, you know, if you want it like what quick, good and cheap or something, it's impossible. We've, yeah. we've been able to accomplish at least close to that. Nice. Um, and just really employing some unique experience, some unique things. And so, so if you, if, if you guys have any challenges out there, we'd love to hear about them. We'd love to try to help. We'd love to just, I don't know. We w- we want to build cool shit. So if you're doing that, call us, you know, awesome. we're in. Mike, thanks for coming on. <laughs> cool. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.